a different round of sanctions throughout the last couple of months. And as you know, that journalistic work, but also the, uh, the real work is still ongoing and we'll, we're looking forward to um, a potential nine package, um, including an oil price cap, um, possibly in the next coming weeks. So we'll discuss that um, as well. Um, the um, our today's uh, today's discussion is about the cat and mouse game, so very much about how um, what are the effect of these sanctions, how are they enforced, what is the goal, and do they actually achieve the goal that they were entailed um, to do in the first place? So that is something that I would like to discuss with this with this panel. First of all, I already apologize for pronouncing um, these names, as I'm not a Polish native speaker, as you um, may hear. I'm I'm a Belgian Belgian native. Uh, one of the few, probably in the Brussels European bubble. Um, but um, as as said, I'd first like to introduce Mrs. Wisniewska, Wy the most difficult name of all, <laughs> a senior research fellow at the at the Center for Eastern Studies. Um, then there's Anna Dinner, a senior research fellow at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Her colleague, Mrs. Katza, also a senior research fellow at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. And last not least, Mrs. Taran, who is a research fellow here at the European Policy Center. Um, I will first give each of them the floor for about five minutes to introduce their specific expertise. After that, we'll have a, a panel debate among us. And of course, in the end, I would very much like to open the floor to all of you to, um, to ask or give you the possibility to ask any questions that you may have. So first, you have the floor to discuss the impact of sanctions on the Russian economy and the energy sector, and then we'll get to all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, in my short presentation, I will concentrate on three points. Uh, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, in my short presentation, I will concentrate on three points, in which are, in my opinion, the crucial for the present situation in Russia. First of all, that uh, economic situation has become a crucial element of Russian propaganda since the invasion. Uh, we have to remember that part of the um, statistical data are not published anymore, and we should be very critical uh, towards others which are still uh, m public. Uh, the sec uh, uh, what we can observe, um, the results of these sanctions, uh, first of all, um, we, uh, we observe the decline in Russian GDP this year, and probably it will be 3 or maybe 6%. Uh, it depends on the uh, um, oil embargo and price cap, uh, mostly. And the, the, scale of, the scale of this um, um, decrease. And what is the most important, that the first time Russia's economy uh, is in crisis when the uh, oil, uh, oil prices are high from the 60s. Yeah? Uh, that's it, and in my opinion, this is, uh, this is uh, present as the power of the sanctions. Uh, and when we look, for example, for Russian budget, I think this is the play. Uh, this is the um, this is the uh, part in which we can observe the uh, negative effects of, of sanctions. First of all, uh, revenues generate, uh, generated by uh, high gas and oil prices um, are no longer enough to cover uh, increasing uh, expend uh, expenditures, budget expenditures. Uh, Russia's budget has been in a deficit, monthly deficit, uh, um, uh, since June. Um, and uh, Russian authorities, to cover their needs, uh, used three instruments. First of all, they decided to increase uh, tax burden, especially on the energy sector. Gazprom will have to pay more than 1.2 trillion rubles. It's 1% of Russian GDP additional this year. First block of this money uh, went to the budget in October, and the next two blocks uh, we expect in November and December. Uh, the second uh, source of um, funds for the budget is uh, Russian Minister of Finance increasing, uh, are incre is increasing um, internal debt. Uh, last month, uh, they uh, issued uh, more than one trillion rubles 
public uh, bonds. And it's, it's once again, it's the next 1% of GDP, Ru Russian uh, GDP. Uh, most of these, uh, no, not most, all of these bonds were bought by Russian state banks uh, we, uh, m m for the money which they get, uh, which they got from Russian central bank. It means it just it it is just a printing money. And the third uh, source of funds, uh, it is of course uh, Russian reserves, uh, uh, money from the uh, national wealth funds. Most of them were uh, frozen by uh, Western countries uh, in March. But thanks to the um, technical operation between Central Bank and Ministry of Finance, uh, Russian government still can have uh, uh, still can have access to them. And the last point, it's about um, energy sector. So far, there is no, uh, there has been no decline in oil production. Uh, in September, we, we even uh, observe um, slide according to Russian official, official statistics, I should add. Uh, even we, we could observe um, a slight growth, but uh, according to the International uh, Energy Agency, um, in September there was a, um, a, decreased, uh, a decrease in uh, export, Russian export of oil, uh, by uh, half million uh, barrels per day. It's around 7% compared to the pre, uh, before the invasion levels. Uh, it's not a huge difference, but uh, we observe a change in a direction of Russian export. First of all, uh, the, share, uh, the share of EU countries uh, decreased. Uh, now uh, it's around 35% of Russian export. Uh, before the invasion, it was 50%. But what is more important, the share of the um, the share of unknown customers are increasing, and this is the 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 the, uh, the in, uh, this indicates that Russian companies prepare themselves for embargo from price cap for uh, for price cap and they looking for um, shadow schemes uh, to circumvent uh, the sanctions uh, and the last point it's a situation in russia gas sector which uh, uh, has uh, has suffered not from uh, from uh, western san uh, sanctions but uh, from counter sanctions of russian government and uh, russian gas blackmail um, and uh, production of gas from uh, 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 decreased by 30% year on year in September, and export of gas proms outside former Soviet Republic decreased by 70% year on year. The company is a, 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 has a huge problems. Uh, of course, there is no ch uh, uh, chance to to, to uh, redir redirect this gas to to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, Asian uh, countries because there is no technical possibility. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I will try to focus on military issues as I'm an, in normal life, I will say, say, put it like that. I'm an expert on uh, uh, military issues, not uh, not sanctions and such, but I try to do my best. So once more, good uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to uh, to be here. And I will start with uh, two short lists. First one, uh, Russian military equipment. Main battle tanks, T-72, T-19, T-80, T uh, BWM with uh, the all um, variety of uh, modifications. Um, navigation system uh, for Su-30 um, and MiG-29 fighters. Iskander-M, Iskander-K, uh, KH-101, KH-59, Kalibu cruise missile, uh, missile 9M-49, Torem-2, Tornado-S, um, Orlan unmanned aerial vehicle, and uh, uh, Ki-A-55 uh, helicopter, and the second list, 
the US, Japan, Taiwan, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany, Republic of Korea, United Kingdom, Austria, France, Italy. What are in common? That the equipment on those list of Russian military equipment, the component of that, uh, were found that they are coming directly from those countries from the second list. So, um, of course it's true that uh, the EU and the US imposed sanctions on Russia. They started to impose them in uh, 2014, just after uh, Russia invade Ukraine and start to occupy uh, Crimea. But nevertheless, um, during these times, it occurred that still Russia was able to buy those systems, uh, those components uh, in the market from those countries. Uh, some of them try to even cooperate um, in the shadow sphere. So uh, it's, uh, it's still um, very, um, very important. Uh, and uh, what is interesting, uh, Rossi, uh, the British uh, think tank, um, identified uh, 450 foreign component in Russian military equipment, of which uh, 317 uh, came from EU-based companies. Majority of them were uh, navigation system, optoelectronic system, devices, microchips, and semiconductors. Um, uh, so, um, then uh, when we are thinking about, of course, sanctions were imposed on the main Russian military companies. Uh, however, still, they co can cooperate with partners among the world. Uh, moreover, Russia was, and still to some extent, is dependent on Western technologies, um, but uh, still it's able to produce some military equipment, and we also have to think about additional sanctions, not only connected with some, how to say, very sophisticated electronic devices, but also with something very uh, simple, such as steel and some other components which are, for instance, necessary uh, to being tank shells uh, and all of those equipment which is uh, connected with uh, uh, tanks, military infantry, uh, infantry vehicles and so forth so on. Um, so, of course, it's true that nowadays we can observe that Russia has returned to Soviet-made uh, um, ammunition, to Soviet-made uh, missiles, to Soviet-made uh, rockets, uh, but still, which we have to be um, very uh, careful, it's the first issue is espionage, uh, which is very evident uh, in the case of uh, it's uh, in case of Russia. But the second issue is that we, I mean, both uh, EU slash NATO member states, um, have to think about all of those um, countries in which we are cooperate with. Uh, and when we are uh, selling our electronic uh, components to military equipment, because there were plenty of evidences that Russia was able to buy or to, hmm, how to say, uh, to, um, um, to, 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 to steal those, uh, those technologies from, uh, from other countries. So, um, the next step, uh, not only, um, when we are thinking not only about imposing sanctions, it's first of all that we have to, pre to prevent building uh, new supply chains of military components. Uh, then that we have also to cooperate with um, our partners. Uh, then we have also to think about, um, how to say, focusing on regular, um, pro uh, regular buying chains because some components still can be just uh, bought during, uh, through online distribution. Of course, we have to be very precise when we are thinking about um, our end user um, certificates because there are plenty of times when Russia uh, used this false uh, end user certificates. Uh, then still uh, it's very visible that Russia is using, using th third countries for transshipment of the military components. Uh, so it's not only uh, thinking about our direct contact with, uh, with uh, Russia. And uh, just uh, to sum up, of course, nowadays, Russia didn't and doesn't stop uh, producing military equipment. However, uh, the new produced uh, equipment is much worse than those uh, that were produced during last, uh, last years. So, of course, it's uh, our last, uh, last um, my, my, my last um, word, it's uh, that 
uh, it's not only a sanctions, it's also uh, giving uh, a new born military equipment to Ukraine, which is uh, um, better than Russian one, which can help Ukrainian to, uh, to win this war. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. And I think that very much lay out what the, the challenges are when it comes to not just sanctions or sanctions enforcement, but also more broader, like you said, in, in the supply chain and the general um, general trade with, with Russia. Um, but it does fit very nicely with your subject, the, the um, evasion and the circumvention of sanctions. Please go ahead. Ah, yes. Uh, Welcome to uh, everybody here. Uh, I will be speaking about the most uh, meaningful practices uh, to circumvent sanctions on Russia as reported uh, by media and watchdogs in open uh, sources and some EU problems uh, on it. And I will start with the oil sector because sanctions in this field are obviously the most important uh, because uh, the sale of oil gives uh, the high revenue uh, to Russian national uh, budget. And although um, uh, EU oil embargo and price cap will enter soon. Russian companies have been uh, already uh, concealing the source of the sold oil, uh, and we have noticed uh, many practices in this respect. Uh, the reason is that some countries an, uh, implemented oil embargo that many companies uh, uh, voluntarily boycotted uh, Russian oil and many customers uh, prefer to hide the purchase of Russian oil for image reasons or to simply uh, avoid high insurance costs. And so what are the practices uh, the, uh, to avoid scrutiny? Uh, Russian oil is uh, transshipped at sea, not at ports. Uh, and for instance, the tankers can have uh, OPEC ownership structure, they can use false registration numbers, they can use false flags. The crews can uh, use, uh, uh, manipu can manipulate uh, location systems to avoid detection of vessels. Uh, and uh, the transshipment routes are very diverse, uh, going through, for instance, Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea, near the coast of Malta, Greece, Gibraltar, and also North Central Atlantic. Uh, additionally, uh, Russian crude oil is mixed with other crude uh, types of crude oil um, in refined products such as gasoline, uh, chemicals, uh, or diesel. And media, for instance, report cases that um, Russian oil is refined in Turkey and India and then sold to the EU and United States. Um, more on that you can hear <laughs> later on from Ivona, <laughs> which is an expert on energy issues, how, 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 how the trans, uh, uh, how the routes go on. Uh, now the other, uh, the, the other uh, important issue, what Anna uh, mentioned, is that Russian authorities tries to uh, see government sanctions related to all essential components and products which they used to import from Western countries, uh, namely in relation to military sector, high tech and mi microelectronics, because the shortages uh, in those uh, products have occurred to be very uh, difficult for them. Uh, and they uh, obtain those sanctioned goods primarily through third countries which are not bound by sanctions. And we have a very long list of this club, <laughs> Turkey, India, uh, Kazakhstan, Armenia, uh, Belarus, Iran, etc. Uh, and for instance, the, the most recent example is that United States sanctioned uh, two companies based in Armenia and Taiwan for illegally procuring microelectronics to Russian company Milandr. And for instance, the transfers, financial transfers were made through Swiss company. Uh, the practices are very different one. <laughs> Basically, the most common is to just uh, conclude uh, agreement between Russian companies and companies from third uh, countries, uh, which are only intermediaries of getting foods, uh, of getting uh, stuff and goods from uh, Western countries. Uh, the other, the other practice is, for instance, that custom declarations might be falsified by indicating the false uh, customs code. The invoices might be simply falsified. And we have a very, <laughs> well, very, uh, a huge black market 
of trading sanctioned goods with well-established routes going through uh, free economic zones worldwide, namely through Dubai, <laughs> uh, which is the most busy <laughs> place in this respect. Um, last, not bo last but not least, I would like to mention that EU on its own has big problem with enforcing sanctions. Uh, on the example of uh, implementing sanctions, harsh trade sanctions uh, on Crimea in past years, we, we can see that there were many EU companies breaching or avoiding sanctions. For instance, with uh, the most visible examples of Siemens selling gas turbines through Russian company to Crimea or Osho, uh, continuing to selling its products uh, over there. And uh, if it comes to current sanctions, I think sti still this is a, a case and we have a problem. Um, the example is, for instance, uh, French Total Energies or German uh, BASF selling gas condensate to Russian companies, uh, which might be used to produce jet fuel to uh, to planes bombing Ukraine. <laughs> and if, for instance, in case of France, there is a legal case uh, to, towards Total en Energies recently launched uh, by two NGOs uh, over, uh, over there. And obviously, uh, after Russian invasion, several member states uh, increased the number of legal proceedings, but it is hard to estimate if it is a, a general trade trend in the EU because there is a, a huge lack of publicly available data on how member states in practice are enforcing sanctions, including concrete. I mean, uh, what, what are co concrete frozen uh, assets frozen by particular member states? What legal proceedings are held? Um, uh, what tools? EU member states have and cap investigative capacities in this respect, uh, etc., uh, etc. Uh, the problem is uh, that um, you know the member states practice practices vary significantly, uh, and uh, um, even uh, if passing le legislation of qualifying um, infringement of sanctions as EU crime um, is a good direction, but it will not solve a problem of lack of political will of some of member states to enforce sanctions because simply to have a legal case, you <laughs> the country has to have a good investigative capacities and to build up such investigative capacities, it needs, want to do that. <laughs> So this is a case uh, in point. Um, to conclude, I would like to say that obviously um, all practices to circumvent uh, sanctions uh, only to some extent limit the impact of sanctions. And at the end of the day, the sanctions uh, really make uh, Russian authorities a hard life. But anyhow, if we have an option at EU level to close any uh, loopholes, please do that. <laughs> and <laughs> I, uh, I uh, can have to humble recommendations. First of all, in case of investigations, it would be good if EU member states and its allies, namely United States, increase operational cooperation of various services, meaning financial institutions, uh, customs police, uh, uh, etc., uh, to track circumvention uh, of sanctions to uh, initiate legal cases and possibly blacklist <coughs> the third country's uh, companies participating in such schemes. And my second recommendation is to the European Commission to increase transparency uh, because I think that member states should have an obligation to uh, send regular reports on how they are uh, enforcing sanctions to the European Commission and those reports should be made public to all EU citizens. Mm -hmm. And also the European Commission could fund some NGOs to track circumvention by, uh, of sanctions by uh, <coughs> private companies and uh, EU, uh, EU citizens. All this uh, towards, you know, use more often public blaming and shaming, which in some cases work and in some <laughs> cases not. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And um, 
it's it, I think it's good that you stress that despite all these challenges of enforcement, that of course there is also a very concrete impact of the sanctions as well. Um, and we'll go a little bit more into what the EU can do to uh, to close the loopholes a bit later on. But of course, I first um, give the floor to Mrs. Saran to discuss the EU policy on uh, on the sanctions. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you uh, or, uh, for the organizing for this uh, important uh, event. Uh, I'm from Ukraine, and uh, I would like, first of all, to uh, say that Ukraine is very grateful for uh, uh, that uh, in response to Russian invasion uh, into Ukraine, uh, EU countries uh, very swiftly, uh, just uh, on the same day, uh, imposed uh, first packages of uh, sanctions and uh, uh, have been able to be united uh, in imposing uh, the next packages. And during this very critically important uh, times uh, of uh, European history. And um, uh, as, a, uh, as EU is the largest uh, trading partner of uh, Russia, it has uh, a very significant leverage in uh, uh, expanding the current uh, sanction regime and uh, in uh, making uh, a sizable income on Kre uh, the Kremlin uh, regime. That is why we, uh, we do, uh, Ukraine is uh, uh, addressing and appealing to the EU countries for uh, strengthening uh, sanctions, especially uh, amid the current uh, escalation of the war and uh, current uh, terrorist uh, attacks of Russia on uh, our uh, public uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, so on the one hand, uh, EU has a leverage. On the other hand, uh, uh, EU countries, some, especially some EU countries, uh, still uh, very much rely on uh, uh, supplies from Russia, such as uh, energy, first of all, energy products and, uh, and other uh, products uh, like, uh, uh, for example, semi-finished uh, iron and steel products. Uh, like uh, nuclear fuel, fuel like uh, uh, agricultural uh, fer fertilizers, and uh, other uh, uh, non-ferrous metals, other ro ro critical raw materials. And uh, uh, moreover, this dependence, uh, it uh, has remained even after uh, the year of 2014, the year when uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine and the war has started. And uh, uh, even uh, e EU introduced uh, the first sanctions uh, against Russia, but still these dependencies uh, uh, in some countries even were growing. We, we know these countries. Uh, so, uh, uh, that is why, but what we uh, have seen that uh, this uh, EU, uh, Russia interdependence, inter, uh, like trade interdependence, uh, it uh, failed to prevail Russia uh, from uh, weaponizing its supplies, especially uh, uh, energy supplies, and uh, provoking this uh, 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 like unprecedented uh, uh, energy crisis in Europe. And uh, uh, but still, some EU countries are still uh, like more reluctant to uh, uh, introduce new sanctions and uh, to reduce uh, its dependence on Russian supplies uh, because they, it brings like for them uh, more costs uh, to no, to rep uh, with uh, replacing these Russian products with uh, supplies from the said countries. And, uh, but yet, uh, as uh, if uh, EU wants to, uh, n n not wants other attempts of uh, weaponization with other supplies, which might uh, uh, happen uh, with Russia, uh, you cannot rely anymore on uh, supplies of critical I imports from Russia. And uh, that is why, uh, um, 
uh, no, all this EU supply chain should be diversified and sh sh and the reliance of uh, uh, one supplier, especially if it's uh, uh, aggressive, uh, uh, unpredictable and uh, 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 suppliers that uh, were initiating a lot of conflicts uh, uh, which contradicts European values. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, it's like uh, it it's not in line with the EU policy. It should not be in line with the EU policy. Yes, and with uh, uh, with uh, should should be stopped. Uh, and. Uh, um, uh, so, so I hope that uh, there will be some long-term implications for EU policy in terms of, and and also for uh, European companies' investment decision in terms of uh, of uh, uh, their reconsidering uh, Russia's role in the in their supply chains and also uh, in more coordinated uh, uh, policies in reducing and preventing dependencies uh, on one uh, supplier, which is. Uh, Again, not reliable, aggressive, and uh, so on. And um, uh, as to the scope of sanctions, uh, it sh uh, we think that it should uh, uh, be equivalent to the extent of uh, uh, damages and losses and co uh, consequences that uh, Russia caused in Ukraine. And uh, uh, Again, as war escalates, uh, we have to think uh, how to strengthen uh, the sanctions further, because now uh, we, we can see that uh, it is not a, no, uh, uh, um, it is not enough to stop uh, uh, to stop uh, Russia from its uh, invasion. Uh, so the possible directions for strengthening sanctions, uh, some of them already men were mentioned, but I may, may re uh, reiterate. Uh, so the first um, is extending the scope of sanctions uh, to reduce Russian export revenues. Uh, according to estimates uh, of uh, Kiev School of Economics, 40% uh, of Russian imports, uh, of um, EU imports from Russia are still not sanctioned. 40% uh, it's already includes all the eight packages and uh, oil embargo. Uh, so uh, with oil embargo, eight packages, it's 60%, but 40% is still unsanctioned. And uh, there are some room for uh, including more uh, products, more uh, companies uh, to this. For example, uh, like we, uh, we can say diamonds, they are still not included. And this is the issue here in Belgium uh, because uh, uh, diamonds, uh, trade in diamonds are not sanctioned at all. And we can see even increasing volumes in diamonds, raw, raw diamonds uh, from Russia to, to EU in, uh, after invasion, after the invasion. Uh, uh, in these volumes, I mean not uh, value volumes uh, because of rising prices, but uh, uh, physical volumes, means, meaning that it's real uh, uh, increase <laughs> uh, of purchases. And also uh, uh, introducing a full embargo on iron and metal products. Because for now, uh, yes, uh, some partial embargo was uh, imposed, but this embargo only uh, for uh, finished uh, steel products. And uh, uh, also in the last package, semi-finished uh, uh, steel and iron pro uh, products uh, were included, but with a very long uh, transition wind down periods, like, uh, f for example, for slabs, it's two years, two years from now. We don't know what will be in two years, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I mean, we don't know where will, will be Ukraine, what will be with this war and, and so on. We need, uh, we need, uh, if, no, we need some uh, to impact now uh, to, to stop this. Yes, not in, in postpone in two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, so and some, some uh, uh, iron and steel products, uh, like for exa example, 
uh, cast iron is not even included in this embargo. Uh, it is unsanctioned. So uh, we, uh, Ukraine thinks that uh, we uh, we can extend this embargo for all ex uh, for all imports from Russia to EU of all metal, uh, iron and steel products. Why? Because uh, uh, it is not like unique products and it can be replaced from other countries, even from Ukraine par uh, partially. Yeah. Why? Because Ukraine is, uh, you <laughs> okay, before invasion used to be a, a, a big producer and exporters of uh, metal products, uh, including cast iron and also semi-finished uh, uh, iron and steel products, uh, but uh, because of the invasion uh, and uh, because uh, Russia disrupted two major uh, plants in uh, metal metallurgical uh, plants in Mariupol, uh, uh, we yes we uh, our production capacity uh, has been reduced by thirty percent, but still we can uh, we still uh, have a lot of capacities to uh, to export and uh, to ex and even to replace ra russian products mm -hmm. and uh, if the, re the our logistic uh, uh, problems will be uh, uh, resolved uh, again which we uh, experience because of russia uh, blockade of uh, seaport um, uh, Ukraine w will be able to uh, replace Russian in EU supply chains of this. Uh. And also, um, uh, the, the second one, uh, the second direction is expanding export control measures. It was said that, uh, 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 first of all, I would, I would like to say that according to Kiev School of Economics, about 55% of uh, EU export to Russia is not yet sanctioned, 55%. So there is a uh, big room for increasing uh, uh, export control sanctions. And uh, also not only f uh, for uh, uh, like dual uh, use products and military uh, products, uh, but uh, other, uh, other products that are important for uh, Russian economy and uh, uh, cannot be replaced very easily. And uh, th this is like EU is a major uh, supplier of this product to Russia. And also uh, the uh, next uh, direction is encouraging a more company level self uh, uh, sanctions that uh, usually go far beyond country level compu uh, compulsory sanctions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, even in uh, unsanctioned, unsanctioned sectors that are not, no, cannot be agreed on, on, on EU level because of uh, yes, pro problems with different member states, but, uh, but uh, s um, companies can self-impose uh, uh, sanctions and, and do this work and withdraw trade and investment uh, with Russia uh, on their own. Uh, I will, I will uh, uh, finish. Uh, the next one is pre yes, preventing sanctions uh, circumvention, uh, which you already covered. So I will be very briefly that uh, again, it's uh, addressing loopholes in current uh, um, sanction re regime, especially in military sector, especially be because there are still loopholes in this and uh, dual use products, I improving coordination of sanctions implementation at the EU level and among coalition in the countries and uh, taking stronger enforcement actions. Uh, and uh, and also there is a, um, maybe a possibility, um, like another uh, direction is uh, prolonging renewal periods for economic sanctions uh, till, uh, because now it's, uh, it's uh, uh, sanctions should be renewed every six months uh, and, uh, and all, 27 countries should agree on this. And this actually threatens the EU, uh, EU uh, un uh, unity, unanimity, <laughs> uh, because some, ca uh, some uh, EU members can, can uh, uh, suggest to lift some sanctions mm -hmm. or to um, bargain. Or, uh, uh, so maybe um, uh, taking into account this uh, historic uh, importance of, of, of uh, sanctions and this, you know, to 
to to end this war, maybe uh, you should consider this uh, to prolong this uh, renewal and also maybe even to uh, upgrade its uh, decision making uh, process on sanctions uh, again to make it more flexible and to make it uh, uh, more uh, to make sanctions more ambitions mm -hmm. more ambitions because uh, otherwise. Uh, 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 taking into account all, all this uh, con uh, consensus uh, decision it, uh, means that uh, uh, some decisions should be compromised and mm -hmm. not so ambitious as uh, otherwise. And also uh, the, the last point is uh, that uh, yes, uh, uh, as sanctions entail costs for both sides, uh, so it uh, Maintaining this uh, uh, EU unity uh, can be very uh, no challenging, and uh, but it is very crucial for Ukraine and for uh, for creating the conditions to end up to end this war as soon as possible. So uh, uh, so yes, there is a, a big uh, uh, responsibility for national governments to. Uh, to share you know, this responsibility with the EU uh, for explaining and for uh, addressing uh, its citizens uh, about the reasons and uh, of the sanctions mm. and their impacts and uh, why it's so important uh, and uh, possible implications. And um, and all, but uh, also it's very important that uh, yes uh, that EU unity not compromise with the uh, ambition of sanctions because any concessions uh, can only uh, lead to prolongation of this war mm -hmm. which uh, is nobody is interested in. Thank you. And thank you. And that's what I wanted to ask you as a follow up because you mentioned the EU unity. Of course, in the beginning we had a very swift response then. There was a lot of discussion about bargaining, negotiation, sanctions fatigue. Was there? Is do you have a certain um, disappointment in the EU process when it comes to implementing new sanctions? Now again, we're talking about a ninth sanctions package. Mm -hmm. We had the events in Poland. Um, it wasn't enough to to proceed with a with a next sanctions package. Is there? Do you feel a certain disappointment, or is that? Of course, Ukraine is interested in uh, uh, in um, uh, like uh, greater coverage and in uh, uh, in uh, immediate impact. Mm -hmm. Yes, that uh, because uh, we we mentioned that uh, because of these uh, exemptions, we, because loopholes, because yes. of uh, 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 wind out without periods, yes. uh, we have uh, the impact of sanctions uh, is just postponed. It will, uh, it can be uh, like a, a uh, felt only in maybe in middle t uh, no, not not now not not <laughs> now but in some uh, like longer term but uh, Ukraine needs of course uh, 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 Ukraine is not interested in uh, uh, continuation in of this war because every day we uh, we, lo uh, we lose uh, lives people's lives and also you no know, it's uh, uh, it's a big damage economic damage mm. uh, so no it's not in our interest at all. So we need uh, 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 EU support, uh, uh, f uh, uh, military, financial, economic, and also in sanctions uh, and now. So mm -hmm. of course, uh, uh, but um, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, that we uh, I. Uh, Kiev School of Economics and uh, there are uh, experts that are working on uh, different uh, suggestions how it can be strengthened on uh, what sanctions should uh, should be uh, included in the next uh, package and I think that uh, uh, EU no, sh should balance about uh, 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 satisfying their needs in some critical imports yeah. and uh, uh, trying to sanction uh, uh, Russia and uh, trying to uh, uh, to accelerate the end of this war as soon as possible. Mm. So uh, 
because for it's not in the EU uh, uh, interest as well to <laughs> to make it prol uh, in the, no, prolong this mm -hmm. uh, this war. So uh, yeah. that is why maybe uh, uh, yeah. Um, other options should be uh, uh, considered in uh, and uh, cutting uh, Russian supplies. Maybe n it's not so critical for a UN. It can be uh, uh, replaced by other other countries' uh, yeah. Yeah. import. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'd like to zoom in a little bit on energy because we have the the oil embargo um, finally, you could say, kicking in, and we have a lot of discussion on the oil price cap. You already mentioned how important the oil is for, for Russia's economy um, and how we, we risk a lot of circumvention. Um, how can we how can we avoid that? What are your suggestions in these next next coming weeks to to avoid this scenario? You know, I think that the whole world. Oh, sorry. I think the whole world is waiting for the fifth uh, of uh, December, uh, and there is a big question marks: what will be the f effect of um, embargo and the price cap? Uh, of course. Um, uh, there is no possibility to redirect all Russian oil from EU, EU to Asia and other markets. But of course, uh, in some extent, it is possible. And the question is, what extent? And the question is about the price of the um, oil after the 5th of November. Yeah, Because uh, what we observe in a um, gas sector, although uh, Gazprom reduced its export volumes of exports uh, in a huge extent still can earn uh, much more money than the, it earned last year that's why you know uh, in this ca uh, in this um, situation par uh, partly russia oil sector russian oil sector can compensate its uh, its losses uh, thanks to the higher prices but there is no sure we are we can't be sure that uh, this uh, we we should expect uh, growing uh, of prices that this is you know i think uh, i i can't un answer the question what will be the effects of it uh, but uh, definitely what we, uh, this, this uh, shadow, probably you've, uh, you've read about this shadow fleet of uh, tankers which are uh, creating uh, in the world uh, that last uh, month a lot of uh, tankers were, uh, were bought by uh, unknown uh, buyers uh, from Dubai, from Singapore and others. Uh, but this is the question, not only a, a fleet, uh, because most of these tankers, we are talking about old one. And for example, uh, and the, the second part of the price cap, it's also a problem of uh, insurance and reinsurance. And this is the question, if we've already heard, even from Turkey, that they are not ready to open Bosphorus for, uh, for uh, uninsured uh, tankers. And the same is Danish uh, strength. That's why, you know, there is a lot of uh, question marks. That's why very hard to say how it will be introduced. But definitely, uh, you know, we have to prepare also ourselves uh, investigations uh, of owner of buyers, uh, uh, and ev we, we should we should do everything which we ever and use every instrument we, we have to protect circumventing uh, uh, to protect from circumventing by Russian companies. Uh, the sanctions. Yeah. You're just uh, like I'm that. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no worries, thank you. Um, maybe would you like to add something? Because especially on the regions that we have to look at, you already mentioned um, Dubai, you mentioned a couple of well as well. How can the, the EU and its allies um, convince third countries to not not per se have the same sanctions, but at least to avoid circumventions of sanctions via these via these third countries? Well, this is a very hard task <laughs> because uh, you have very few instruments as an EU. EU does not uh, uh, have extraterritorial sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, like US. Uh, yeah, like US. And uh, in case of US, the penalties are very high and uh, the companies uh, from third countries uh, 
uh, are scared of uh, such penalties, uh, but the EU has option to uh, to blacklist uh, third countries companies participating in circumventing uh, schemes and uh, it can together with uh, United States just uh, you know blacklist the same companies uh, to have uh, you know a mutual uh, reinforcing yeah. <laughs> Uh, effort this might be done but then you have a problem with countries such as Turkey <laughs> you yeah. know I, they help uh, with a grain deal and you know it is quite a difficult case and I think in this case the diplomacy <laughs> should step up uh, and uh, you know we have EES uh, uh, here and also the member states uh, diplomatic uh, corpuses and Th this should be uh, part of informal, obviously, uh, talks uh, with third countries, mm -hmm. as in case uh, with uh, India, uh, for, for, for instance. Uh. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> because there is no... When we are talking about the um, price cap, uh, there is no sense for China or for India pay for Russian oil more than they can pay uh, that could pay if the uh, uh, price cap is uh, is working. Yeah, that's why I can't I can't imagine a situation that uh, uh, India or China will pay much more uh, for the Russian oil uh, than could using the price cap because they still can um, this uh, because Russia they, uh, have no other option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they are completely dependent now f uh, fr uh, on these countries. And when we are talking about China, I think this is completely out of this uh, game because uh, most of Russian contracts with Chinese company were s uh, were signed ten years ago, and they were signed. Uh, 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 Russian companies, uh, Rosneft, first of all, uh, got huge credits from China, which are now repaid by uh, oil um, uh, export. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, the we, we, we even know the, the real price of this uh, Russian oil uh, exported to, uh, to, to, to China. And, but in my opinion, it's uh, much less than we uh, will think about uh, the level of price cap will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, that's the challenge. Um, I'll have one more question before I, I give the um, the floor to the room. Um, maybe for one for you, um, Mrs. Dinner, uh, you talked about the, the components from the Russian military equipment um, also in the normal supply chains and how we could tackle this more. Why why hasn't that happened yet and how what can the EU do about that? Do you have specific examples, I was wondering? Uh, you know, first of all, is the question of um, who do we sell uh, our components um, and uh, how e also EU uh, companies try to avoid those sanctions. Because some of them, uh, there were some companies um, from France, some of them from Italy, some of them some other countries, uh, which still after uh, the embargo, uh, after 2014, uh, try to um, uh, to uh, sell those goods to to Russia. So it's one issue. Second issue is that uh, uh, it's a question of thinking of this um, um, of this end user certificate. Yeah. Uh, how to put it uh, into our EU leg legislation? Uh, just to uh, at least try to protect ourselves from selling those uh, or even shifting those uh, those components to Rosh uh, to Russia via brokers via some very specific components. Um, Elzbieta mentioned this problem with uh, with the question how EU sanctions and not the U.S. because the U.S. has uh, much uh, more possibilities to to sanctions other companies uh, from the second uh, the, the third countries. Uh, but nevertheless, that I think that we have to cooperate with the U.S. Uh, and to use also day tools um, because uh, then we will try to avoid those uh, loopholes and to um, try not to um, sell those goods to um, to the countries which will um, sell them to, to Russia. It's one issue. And second issue is, of course, when we are thinking also about our legislation, about with whom we are uh, trading with, 
uh, it's a question of um, the responsibility of uh, the how to say last buyer of our um, of our equipment, um, and uh, it's also a way how do we protect the whole documentation of those um, military components and military equipment, because it's not only a question about espionage, but uh, it's a question that sometimes or even very often Russia was trying to buy just uh, document the, the documentation, not uh, the issues as such. Uh, so still, uh, it's a huge job to do, uh, how to protect ourselves uh, when we are selling our goods uh, to the, the third uh, countries. I know it will be probably very, very difficult, but nevertheless, uh, I think that we have to at least try to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for us as researchers, it is really uh, hard to say how to close loopholes in this field because all the uh, talks are, you know, non-public on those uh, those issues. But, uh, you know, going through, uh, according to intuition, it would be good if, you know, intelligence services and uh, police uh, officers from member states could exchange data, you know, on what Russians are searching for. There, there used to, in the past, the public leakages, you know, of a list uh, of uh, items they are looking for on international markets as published by Politico, as far as I uh, remember, you know. Th so it is good to have like a, such compre comprehensive analysis at EU and uh, other allies level and, you know, just, uh, just uh, put on sanctions list those uh, dual used uh, the technologies mm -hmm. uh, and if it comes you know uh, about the question what to what else to do how to strengthen uh, sanctions you know i from the beginning of a debate on sanctions uh, you know i have been working for 15 years on eu affairs and i see that negotiations on sanctions are horrif terrible i mean i really appreciate people who work on that because you know <laughs> finding a fo common ground uh, between 27 member states is very difficult i'm coming from a country uh, frontline country where <laughs> children uh, on a playground are playing in a war you know, with Russians, but uh, imagine that in Belgium uh, you feel safe. And <laughs> so this is, you know, the different, fr different threat perception. But uh, I think that, you know, we can have a consensus that we should focus on those uh, sectors which have the greatest revenues for Russian uh, national budget. And definitely we should work on a proper enforcement of oil embargo and, you know, on this operational cooperation. We should think about gas, you know, in the future gas embargo. Uh, you know, to uh, to not uh, to have finally free hands, you know, for long term, <laughs> mm -hmm. to not to not have a comeback, <laughs> you know, uh, to this depend dependency. And the third uh, major sector is military sphere, dual use technologies, high tech, and uh, and micro electronic. Because you know, f uh, if we go, uh, if we start the discussions on some minor sectors, it's like you know, uh, very lengthy negotiations. But we have to see, you know, the, the end, <laughs> final, final goal. So let's focus on the on the priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So oil, gas, uh, and military and technology uh, sectors. Thank you. That's a, a real uh, a good sum up. I think I have some more, but I first want to give the opportunity if someone in the room um, wants to ask a question. Yes, please. Um, in the in the uh, if you can just um, one second, then you'll get a mic. And if you could uh, maybe just state your name and maybe the organization that you're. Okay, Lucio Vinjo Souza, yes, strategic policy, like uh, the colleagues over there. Uh, many thanks for the very impressive discussion. I have one uh, general question and one particular question to Mr. Statham. My general question is related to how would you assess, because this was a sort of a missing elephant on the room, the level of cooperation that Russia has with the People's Republic of China in terms of implementation of sanctions and in more terms, in terms of the overall res uh, relation that we have between Russia and China, right? So I think that that's something that is strategically is extremely relevant for us. Uh, practical question in relation to Mrs. Staran. She made two enticing suggestions for us to encourage, quote unquote, firms to do self-sanction at firm level. In practical terms, how do you see 
us doing that, what type of actions or type of instruments you would uh, foresee if we were go down this route. And I extend the same question on your uh, point that we should improve sanctions procedures. Uh, beyond the question of us prolonging the uh, time duration of sanctions, do you have something more precise, more specific in mind? Those would be my two questions. Thank you. Maybe we can start with the second question for you. Uh, yeah, so of uh, questions on uh, self-sanctions. Uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, good examples of such uh, self-sanctions. Uh, uh, that we are made by companies on their own because their own values are not in line with uh, uh, what uh, Russia is doing in Ukraine or uh, because uh, under the public pressure uh, they uh, care about their uh, reputation and care about their customers and customers uh, uh, do not support what Russia is doing that is why they have to impose these self-sanctions even in uh, sectors that are not sanctioned by, by uh, government. And, uh, and we have uh, this uh, already even in by oil companies that uh, oil embargo is not uh, yet in place, but uh, oil companies like uh, Sharon, yes, they, uh, they uh, uh, already uh, did these self-sanctions and uh, 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 because of uh, public pressure and uh, quit their, uh, no, withdraw their operations, uh, transactions with Russia. Uh, uh, how, uh, how it can be done, or, no, again, uh, with uh, public pressure uh, to do this is uh, uh, there are uh, some public uh, databases uh, of companies that watchdog in this uh, company that uh, still have operations with Russia on uh, Russian market uh, or uh, no, they are engaged uh, a lot with uh, Russian. And so mm, to be included in this uh, public uh, database uh, for companies, uh, uh, and this uh, public database is uh, actually prepared by Yale uh, University and also by Kiev School of Economics. No, Ukraine is also doing this. Uh, so uh, being in this uh, uh, database and uh, being watched uh, and uh, uh, being uh, like communicated and uh, no, <laughs> on the first pages um, in daily news, uh, it's, uh, no, it makes this pressure uh, workable. And uh, so it's uh, like one instrument. The other instrument which has been discussed that, for example, uh, uh, companies that uh, do reject to withdraw uh, its operations uh, with Russia should uh, uh, be obliged to uh, uh, they can uh, no they cannot be uh, uh, no they 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 can uh, uh, continue their operations but they should be obliged to public to make public uh, 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 to make it public that they uh, do uh, have business with uh, uh, with Russia. And again, m making this uh, information public uh, will uh, draw attention to these companies and will no, create some public pressure on them. Uh, so uh, uh, this is it. And, the, uh, and the, your next question was? Uh, the sorry. other question was on, on China. And ah, maybe okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's very interesting uh, about the uh, China behaving after the uh, the invasion because I think um, uh, Russia uh, I, I, I I'm much more disappointed by uh, Chinese uh, policy after the invasion. Uh, of course, we can see in uh, in the last month. Uh, uh, Chinese export to Russia increased and is even higher uh, than it was before the uh, uh, last year. Uh, but uh, what we can observe that uh, Chinese company companies are ready to export to Russia, first of all, finished goods, consumer goods, 
there's no problem with uh, smartphones, with uh, cars and all this stuff in Russia. But when we, when you are talk when we are talking about spare parts, uh, investment goods, um, Chinese companies uh, are not uh, ready to 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 um, they, they they just afraid uh, uh, American secondary sanctions, for example. And this is, I think, for example, uh, spare parts to uh, aircrafts. Uh, I I haven't heard uh, any information that they decide that there were some. Uh, circumvention and all, uh, all this stuff. That's why I think uh, it's working. Uh, China's as uh, China as uh, India and as uh, Turkey tries to earn as much as possible on this situation, and they use all opportunity exporting. But uh, as uh, I said. First of all, finishing goods. But still, we, uh, as I said, uh, export uh, the export increased uh, last month. But still, we can't. We we don't know what uh, what was uh, what was the um, reason. Uh, how part of this increase was connected with volumes of export, and how part uh, was connected with uh, prices. Because mm -hmm. if, uh, as we uh, imagine, Russia have to pay for all these goods m m much more than uh, before, the befer before the invasion. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you like to add? Or yeah. No, no, I think I have forgotten uh, about one important <laughs> issue in terms of recommendations that we have to finish, you know, uh, with the business connections with Russian uh, businessmen in the EU, and we should, uh, you know, be very pers persistent in decoupling <laughs> those connections. And I think that, you know, we have a long list of individuals and uh, companies on the EU lists, uh, but still the number of frozen assets uh, is relatively modest, <laughs> I would say. Uh, because you know the mm, uh, there are many countries in which you know Russians Russian oligarchs businessmen invested in real estate uh, uh, in art uh, in yachts etc and uh, you know there are only several countries which frozen assets but the list of countries is uh, very long I think yeah. that Austria Belgium Croatia Cyprus Finland France Greece Spain and Netherlands uh, and Germany and Italy have many assets <laughs> of Russians, but only some of them have frozen. Uh, so there is a scope of maneuver uh, here. And also, for instance, Switzerland has frozen uh, like around 6 billion of euros. But, you know, the estimations <laughs> are that there are more, more much more <laughs> over there. Uh, obviously, there are many, many problems uh, because uh, usually money mm, uh, is invested in such sectors when uh, you cannot easily detect the final beneficiary and there is lots of problems because you know uh, to detect what uh, they, they just registered through intermediaries lawyers accountants and etc or through uh, complex shell companies registered in uh, uh, tax havens like Caymans or uh, in Dubai, and uh, you have uh, good uh, good financial crimes investigation capacities to to detect some, and many member states do not have people, you know, yeah. to do that. And, and for that, should the Commission put more pressure on member states to do exactly this? This? Yeah, I think so. Yes, uh, and you know, it should be, <laughs> and mm, it should be a uh, blaming and shaming uh, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. so so for for now I mean the European Commission is very nice <laughs> with yeah. member states we will share good practices yeah. etc <laughs> but, but you know uh, we need uh, we need action uh, not yeah. uh, dialogue <laughs> because uh, this will not end okay. uh, you want to add one more thing and then we'll go yes, to your I question. I, I would add one more thing. Uh, Ivona mentioned this American secondary sanctions, uh, which regards also military issues. And it's very important because because of the fear of that, uh, Chinese companies also limited themselves in um, selling um, some military equipment to, to Russia. So uh, if we as the EU um, doesn't want to implement and behave in the same way, like putting the secondary sanctions, it probably will be a totally different discussion and not, not for today. Um, the only uh, issue is to cooperate with the US and to spread our information about uh, um, some brokers, some countries which are doing the same, um, and uh, how to say, 
to use to some extent the US with their options and their secondary sanctions uh, is one issue. And I totally agree with, uh, with Ella that probably we also have to think about uh, more transparency when we find out such um, uh, chain of uh, um, of military equipment, we also have to put it publicly, just to also use this blaming and shaming. But uh, also, it's a way how can we influence um, the societies. The more that directly those components are used in an items uh, who kill people uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, in everyday uh, in everyday life. So, so that's that's the issue. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, the gentleman here first was, was the first. Could you pass on the mic? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Better. At the beginning of the invasion, um, the, the EU, on par with the US, took the drastic decision uh, to severe the, the links uh, with the, the Russian banks with the SWIFT uh, financial mechanism. This decision was supposed to have uh, huge uh, impact on, on the Russian economy, but uh, now we, we didn't hear about it. We, we, we hear of volumes of exports between and trade between China and Russia and, and India and uh, Iran. So could some of uh, you bring some light on the effects of the, this decision on, 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 on the Russian economy? Thank you. It works very good, but we, uh, as a West, uh, limited ourselves, and the SWIFT uh, was only 10 Russian bank. In Russia, we have nowadays something around 300 banks, which still can cooperate with uh, Western world. That's why uh, you know only part of them are on the uh, are the list uh, are on the lists uh, uh, and covered by sanctions. That's why there is no there there is no a problem. Even a Gazprom bank, which is uh, a, a partly bank connected with Gazprom, but partly it's a bank uh, uh, connected from uh, for uh, connected with Bank of Rassi, uh, Russia, which is a, a just a, a money box of Putin. That's why you know uh, we are very we were we limited ourselves uh, a lot. That's why it's working. And when we are talking, for example, about uh, um, uh, cooperation with China, India, uh, there is a problem with Western currencies because uh, they are toxic for the most of Russian companies. That's why uh, they try to use other currencies. First of all, ruble. Uh, in when we are talking about cooperation in a post-Soviet uh, region. Uh, but, for example, in China, there is increased of um, yuan. Uh, in, uh, in, um, and, of course, we have still cryptocurrencies. Yeah? And this is, this, uh, this is the also way how to deal with the uh, financial problems and uh, financial chains. Right, thank you. Yeah, maybe. You know, um, issue with uh, the <laughs> introducing uh, SWIFT was the you know the the EU uh, legislation gave like a long period of time, uh, like several days for Russian banks. Uh, so they they uh, prepared uh, you know in advance for that. This is not the way <laughs> of uh, of doing with SWIFT. You have to be very quick <laughs> to uh, to produce a, a chaos. Uh, over there, and with the EU uh, sanctions, it was like several days given for Russian banks to uh, to, to prepare. But the other issue is, you know, that uh, sanctions on SWIFT, uh, uh, on banning access to SWIFT, uh, 
it, you know, you, you can use other types of uh, communication. The issue is of freezing assets and blacklisting Russian banks. Uh, and when you cannot uh, do any financial transaction, this is the meaningful sanctions uh, introduced. But the problem is what, uh, uh, what Ivona mentioned, that we have uh, not covered uh, all banks uh, by those sanctions. Uh, and we, we see that, for instance, Russians uh, trade in rupees with in Indian banks uh, have uh, recently uh, been allowed to do such transactions with Gazprom, uh, so uh, you can see they can go for barter with other uh, with other countries, uh, etc. All right, thank you. Very clear answer, I think, to your question. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Robert Stelham, a former uh, Polish uh, and a NATO official currently at Puaski Foundation. Um, thank you for organizing this because this is an extremely important topic and should be very topical uh, in this town. But the truth is, and it shines through your reactions, it's not. I mean, I'll say it not just because Madame Mons is on the panel, but, you know, Politico is probably doing more to actually highlight uh, the problems than, than many institutions which are here. That, that's the reality. It's the Brussels battle at its worst. Uh, I kind of agree with almost everything you said, but it's one issue, and I thought I'll disagree, but you started talking about this in a way which perhaps means I also agree. But let me, uh, it's, it's a suggestion. I would like your, uh, your comment on this. Uh, this question of naming and shaming and publicizing. One of the problems is that, apart from all the others, there's no time, <laughs> uh, is that the, the issue of sanctions is portrayed ex almost exclusively in the terms of the fact of costs, right, to those countries, in this case the European Union and others, who impose it. Uh, when we talk about the war and, and the effects it has energy-wise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, Taran has alluded to this, but it's obviously from a Ukrainian perspective, it all looks very clear. Uh, wouldn't you agree that perhaps, and, and perhaps you could actually talk a little bit about this, that, that there needs to be a stronger case made in public, and actually naming and shaming is the right thing to do. Who knows whether the fact that Siemens actually decided to claim that it's going to stop the cooperation with Russia, and by the way, most people were surprised that it still has. We're talking about servicing the Russian energy grid de facto. So uh, wouldn't you say that there are quite a number of arguments, some of them are even economic nature. If somebody wants to, you know, not to prolong the war, wants to actually shorten it, well, actually tightening the sanctions and the implementation is one way of doing this. If you want to talk about decreasing costs, well, punishing the, the guilty party actually helps. And the third issue related to this, um, it's not much so far about this, uh, this, this uh, you know, although, not enough, but still quite a large number of assets have been frozen, Russian assets, but they have not been released. That's where the low hanging fruit is. So if I may, sorry, it's slightly long, but it's an impo I believe it's an important issue. Uh, how, what would be the arguments that you put forward, because you know, ethical arguments simply do not work <laughs> in many <laughs> places, I'm afraid, uh, but those which appeal to kind of economic benefits and even those who you know, want to see the end of the war, to better explain why sanctions are actually an important instrument in, in, in doing that. Could I perhaps entice you to say a few more words about this? Thank you. Maybe you can start on the economic... Uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, what is important, uh, except the moral uh, element, yeah, for example, uh, that 20 years and maybe uh, longer, 30 years of existing uh, Russian uh, in a modern way, they exported their way of uh, business, model of business to Western countries. And we accepted it. They export corruption to us, uh, to corruption, not only economic corruption, they exported uh, political corruption. That's why I think uh, this is the... Mm, uh, this is the field, this is the uh, level on which we should here in Europe and w wider in the West dis discuss when we are talking about Russia and about Russian money. And uh, because, uh, you know, we, uh, I, can I can understand why City, for example, were uh, uh, ready to accept all Russian uh, money. Uh, not only city, because uh, in Europe uh, also we, we observe uh, we we observed uh, 
uh, this uh, this huge uh, uh, intro of money. But uh, but I think this is this is the this is the point. Uh, first of all, we should now maybe it's too late uh, because most of this money was uh, laundered very very well uh, during the last 20 years but this is the this is the, the field and this we should con uh, concentrate on on uh, the roots of this money when we have uh, meetings with business uh, which stayed in Russia uh, because they are telling us where some companies have left but we, uh, well, we see a business <laughs> over there. So we are just explaining, you know, um, uh, how, how economic terms of conducting business over there uh, are going to be worsened and, uh, and worsened. And they really fear, you know, about future developments. They are wondering if to uh, leave finally Japan. German, French companies, they are, uh, they are wondering. Uh, so we are just, you know, telling them about possible scenarios, you know. In <laughs> if I may add, when uh, last quarter, um, uh, Russian consumption decreased by 10%. It is, uh, this is the, I think this is the very good point when we are talking about business in Russia, yeah? Uh, there is no uh, demand. And uh, first of all, you have, uh, I can understand why a lot of uh, European Western companies invest in Russia in the beginning of 20s, yeah? Because the risk was very high, but the earns were much higher. Nowadays, the risk are much higher, but the earns, which you can get, are much, uh, are, uh, are uh, small, yeah? And maybe maybe just one the question on on the, um, the freezing of assets and then sorry and then releasing them. I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit more on that. We talked about a little bit that not a lot of countries are are even seizing the assets, or is, uh, but then nothing happens to the money. So what can we do about that? You know there is a, a EU legislation uh, making easier to confiscate uh, the assets, but you know generally. Uh, <laughs> the as Euro, uh, as Europol is reporting, generally in the EU member states, the level of confiscating assets uh, in c normal crimes is very ro low. You know, and so <laughs> you uh, could s see that uh, you know, in terms of confiscating uh, assets of oligarchs, if you have a, a criminal proceeding. Mm -hmm. Uh, could also be uh, very, very, very low. Mm -hmm. And the problem is you, uh, also that member states do not have a good, a good investigative capacities uh, in financial crimes, uh, you know, to prove. Because you have an oligarch with very good lawyers, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, you know, in cases of sanctions, uh, for instance, related to after Arab Spring, uh, uh, which took place in France, <laughs> they, uh, the legal proceedings took several years, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the it, it takes time and you, you do not know how many of those proceedings will finish with success mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. story. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Unless there's one more pressing question, I would like to wrap up there. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for, organize, for organizing.